Greetings, Corpse Clubbers, and welcome to another episode of Corpse Club Horror BFFs. I am one of your horror BFFs, Patrick Bromley, joined as always by my horror BFF, Heather Wixon. Hey, Heather. Hello, Patrick. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thanks for staying up late to talk about this movie with me. Is it late? Is it early? I don't know anymore. Because it's I've both. Been up, I've been up for like... Um, I don't even know how many hours now, but it's been, it's been a lot. <laughs> well, that's why I'm going to trick you and just continually switch which version of this movie I'm talking about. Look, you cannot just keep remaking it. <laughs> you cannot thwart me. I will be ready for all versions. <laughs> we open a few extra tabs on my computer. Give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> we are talking on this very special holiday episode of Horror BFFs about the 2006 remake of Black Christmas, also known as Black Xmas. That way, you know which version we're talking about. Uh, the X is helpful. X going to give it to you. Wow. R.I.P. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry, but I, I'm, I just love the Deadpool usage of it. So I, we, we frequently still say X going to give it to you in our house. <laughs> um, so this is Black Christmas from 2006, directed by Glenn Morgan and written by Glenn Morgan of X-Files fame. Um, what 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 do we where do we want to start with this movie? Because I just rewatched like it for the first time in a long time. I I Ow. maybe rewatched it the when it first came out on DVD and hadn't seen it since. I busted out my DVD that I bought for two dollars from a Seven Eleven, only to discover it's a full screen DVD. Nice. <laughs> so I was like, well, that's why this was two dollars at a Seven Eleven. I had to buy mine on eBay. And the disc was totally messed up. Oh, boy. So, because it was like five bucks. And um, so I didn't give the guy a bad rating because whatever, it's $5. I'm not going to ruin somebody's eBay rating over five bucks. But then I ended up, um, I kind of got through most of the disc and it was just unbearable. So then I ended up switching over to Tubi because uh, it is streaming over there in case anybody who's listening wants to check it out. It's not the unrated version, though. It is the rated version. Oh, I don't know which version I saw. I feel like mine was probably unrated. If it's on the DVD, it probably is unrated. But it was full screen. Mm, oh, you know what? It may not be then. <laughs> you think? People that want full screen want ratings on their movies. They sure do. That sounds like something <laughs> my mother would want. She was one of those who always bought the full screen DVD. Oh, and no. it frustrated me to know. And thankfully, she's on Blu-ray now. So there's like no, I don't have to get annoyed with her preferences on, on how she likes to view things. Yeah. But that was a frustrating few years where I kept trying to explain to her, like, you're this is the worst way to watch a movie. <laughs> So. Uh, so where do you want to start with this one? Because I know you're a big X-Files fan, and I know there's some X-Files tie-ins that you wanted to talk about as well. Yeah, I think for me, um, so I, I was somebody who dragged my ex to see this on Christmas night. When it um, opened. Yes. This movie yeah. opened on Christmas, and we're wondering yeah. why it didn't make a ton of money. Oh, you know what? I think we went the next night. That's what okay. it was. Um, Boxing but, day. Yes. I was like, how else am I going to celebrate Boxing Day? Um, which makes sense because there's a lot of Canadians involved with this production. Um, was, and I think it wasn't it made in Canada as well. Probably. Yeah, it, was in British, it was in British Columbia. Winstead's um, in it. It's got to be Canadian. Well, yeah. I mean, it also, you know, Bob Clark was sort of the, the progenitor of great Canadian horror back with his original Black Christmas. So that right. makes sense. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm making some points here. So this is the delirium setting in. So just enjoy all this. But it was interesting because I'm somebody who came to the original late. Like I've only saw the original Black Christmas like about 10 years ago. OK. So for me, I had nothing to compare it to, um, which is why I realized there's definitely issues with the movie, but I still had fun with it. And I actually think the unrated version is actually pretty fun because it's a little more gnarly in terms of some of the death scenes and it goes a little further with the gore and stuff. Um, but I'm actually a fan of black Xmas and I know a lot of people out there aren't, and that's totally okay. Cause I get it. Cause I mean, when you compare this to Bob Clark's original, like they don't, they're not even on the same wave, wavelength. Um, but I think when you look at it by itself, it's really fun. You know, we had a lot of slasher remakes in the two thousands and I do think it's, it's definitely one of like this mid range, to lower 
end of the better ones, if that makes sense. Mid-range to lower end of the better ones. I mean, because, like, for me, like, Sorority Row, I think, is one of the best of the slasher remakes. Okay. Um, You know, I know you rate The Stepfather pretty high. Well, it's very scary, for one. And the just, Stepfather remake? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, The Stepfather remake. Uh, and it has uh, a compelling... <laughs> lead performance I know, I know where you're going with that <laughs> <laughs> can i just say also how amazing it was uh that last year uh you got a very special message i did for christmas it's been a whole year since I you did. heard from mr dylan walsh <laughs> from my friends at the mayo clinic <laughs> yes myself and adam Risky. <laughs> bless his heart like adam i mean because like it was his idea, and I was just like, sure, why not? I'll go along with it. <laughs> Can so, I just say cameos make me very uncomfortable? They make me really uncomfortable, too. Like, what? I don't under, I don't get it. Yeah. Like, I think, like, okay, have you seen the commercial? It's really cute about the, the little girl who's obsessed with Kenny G, and she has a big recital, and her mom gets a cameo from Kenny G to, like, wish her all the best for her, for her recital. It's a cute idea, and I'm sure if I was a little kid obsessed with Kenny G, that would be very exciting for right. me. Like, so I think that there's places for it. For me, it's kind of strange. I mean, but yeah. I wouldn't turn down a cameo from Ryan Reynolds or The Rock. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm sure they do them because, you know, they've got plenty of time to sit around and make videos. Um, have you seen Red Notice yet? I have not. That's on my um, two weeks off viewing schedule of okay. things I just want to watch for funsies. Yeah. So I'm not expecting a whole lot from it, but like, honestly, I, I'm just, I'm, you know why I'm in it. Yes, I do. You know, and that's okay. Like, you know, sometimes I just want to watch a movie with Ryan Reynolds and the rock. Like it's, they made it for me. Patrick. They did. They did. Like somebody upstairs heard my prayers and was like, you know what we should do is put <laughs> Ryan Reynolds and Dwayne Johnson in the same movie. Yeah. Heather finally wins one. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet either, and I may not see it. Uh, you know, I mean, I figure if one night I'm like kind of burned out on Christmas movies, I'll just throw it on or something. But I don't anticipate that happening until the 26th. Right. Boxing Day. Boxing Day. That's again. How else are you going to celebrate Boxing Day other than watching Canada's finest uh, Ryan Reynolds? Right. In a movie with Dwayne Johnson. He's missing from Black Xmas. Yes. And also, funny fun fact is that Dwayne Johnson actually uh, was in the CFL before he was a wrestler. He was in the Canadian Football League. I knew he played football. I didn't know it was in uh, Canada. Yeah. I read that in his, his autobiography way back in the day. I remember that book. I never read it. I did read the McFoley one, though. We, we have multiple copies of the McFoley one in our house as well. Well, so you can Brian, never have too many. Well, Brian was like, is a huge fan of McFoley. In fact, I had the cutest picture of him meeting McFoley at that signing. And he's like, all Brian's all young looking. <laughs> he just looks so excited. So, uh, you know, so we both collectively brought all of our wrestling autobiographies together. Nice. And that's how we knew it was love. <laughs> Twelve and a half years later, here we are. Wow. So, but yeah, I, I'm curious. So did you, so you did not see Black Xmas in theaters? I did not. No, I first like rented the disc on Netflix. Okay. So out of curiosity, being somebody who probably was familiar with the Bob Clark one coming into this, was it a completely jarring viewing experience for me, for you? Or were you able to separate yourself a little bit? No, I'm able to separate myself because they make it. smart. Um, I feel like they make it pretty obvious early on that they're doing something different. Not like so different. They're using kind of the same setup of these girls in a sorority house and there's a killer inside. And But from the very outset, they're not playing the guess who game. They tell you exactly who the killer is. They show you the killer. Um, Most of the movie really is all about Billy Lenz and right. his sister Agnes. Right. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, a difference, too, is that there's two killers instead of the whatever, you know, you never actually find out who the killer is in the original Black Christmas. And the original yeah. Black Christmas is like, you know, I think one of the best horror movies ever made. I would agree with that. Yeah, um, it's amazing. And so, yeah, you can't really compare the two. I don't watch this one and think like, well, this falls short because it's not as good as the original. That's a weird way to watch a remake. Um, 
but that's what people do sometimes. No, I know they do. Yeah. But it's very rare that a remake is as good as the original, especially when they're trying to do something a little bit different. Um, I was not a huge fan of the... What year was it? Was it like two years ago, the Black Christmas remake? Uh, yes, 2019. 2019. Oh, that was a fun time on the internet. <laughs> yeah. I, Dear Lord. I missed most of that. I stayed out of most of it. Um, I didn't love it. And, and, and it's not that I didn't love it because I'm a white man and felt attacked. I just wasn't crazy about the storytelling. Um, so this is definitely my second favorite of the three Black Christmases. Yeah, I would agree. Like, I have some issues with the pacing of 2019. I will say I wish, because, again, the things, you know, and I've said this time and time again, whether in writing or us talking on podcasts, especially when we were doing our remakes uh, run there on Horror BFFs for a while. Right. Um, the, the, the things that I really look for in a remake is, one, you know, does it pay tribute to the spirit of the original and does it set out to chart its own path? And for me, Black Christmas... 2019, I wish they would have leaned into the weirdness that comes out of nowhere in that last 20 minutes. <laughs> right, right, right. Because that to me was freaking awesome. And I know people disagree and that's fine, but like, give me more weird cult shit, you know, like that was to me the interest, the most interesting part of it Yeah, is that the whole movie is this sort of, uh, damning, uh, you know, examination of, you know, what these men have been perpetrating, you know, against women on their campus. And then ultimately you come to find out that there's something else working, you know, sort of in the background. I'm trying to be a little vague because in sure, case people sure, sure. haven't seen it. Right. Um, because it's, you know, I'm never going to tell somebody to not watch a movie, but, you know, I just want to make sure in case some people haven't seen it, which that is streaming on HBO Max, too. Oh, OK. Um, yeah. I just did a whole big Christmas horror streaming thing. So I know where everything's playing. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so it was, it was fine for me. Um, I, I think there's things about it that I really appreciated on a personal level, um, that I wrote about a few years ago, just because I really, it's a movie that I wish kind of existed. in when I was a teenager, because I feel like that might've spoke to me differently than it does as an adult and a little more separated from things. And, you know, so I think what I like about Black Christmas 2006 is like we were sort of in this era. era. You're welcome. Merry Christmas. Um, <laughs> of sort of horror movies really kind of pushing buttons, which was sort of this, you know, response to, you know, Saw and Hostel and Cabin Fever. So this is this is kind of a, a gnarly, nasty little movie. But I like that about it. Like, I like, you know, that it's it it takes away some of the elements that make me really uncomfortable about, about the original Black Christmas, mm -hmm. um, because those phone calls in the original still really crawl under my skin. Um, and that's the beauty of what Bob Clark was able to do with that movie is to make something so innocuous as a phone call feel like the most threatening thing ever. Yeah. Um, and this is just more about like, you know, let's get gory. You know, we're going to just, you know, it isn't really about the women in this, which is a, it's it's not it's it's not a strength. And I'll talk about that more. But um, I do like movies that really kind of aren't afraid to get weird and get gross. And this very much is that, because especially with all the stuff with the Billy Lens uh, background and we get like this whole history and everything like that we get a lot of flashbacks like this movie is probably like at least 30 percent flashbacks <laughs> um but again i think it's kind of interesting and i and i appreciated that about it because again the original we don't really know much about the killer and that's right. why that makes it so brilliant this it's like oh no we're, we're gonna put christmas presents to the killer underneath our tree like he's a tradition like santa and i love the fact that they sort of connect the character of billy lens to Santa in this idea of voyeurism in this, you know, sort of myth mythology. And he's sort of like this figure that looms over the people at the school. Yeah. 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 I, I, uh, I like that approach that again, they're, they're taking the same basic premise or setup of the original film. And then they're like, okay, but what if we flip it and we almost tell it from the killer's perspective? Yeah. Uh, and give him a mythology. And as you said, there are a lot of flashbacks. And sometimes I would argue that the flashbacks come at somewhat inopportune times. They kind of step on the momentum of the film. Um, 
I don't know that I necessarily fault Glenn Morgan for that. Now, obviously, it's because of the producers that he had to work with on this who were notorious for taking films away from directors and basically recutting them how they saw fit. Um, and I, there's, there's a, there are, there Is are this issues dimension that I have are we talking about? Yeah. yeah. The Weinsteins, right. um, you know, they were, that was like their, their, that's what they did. Like, right. you know, if there's a horror movie that came out like in the nineties or the two thousands, that was good, but could have been great. Yeah. It's probably because the Weinstein stepped in and messed it all up. I wonder if there's an instance where like their changes actually made something better. <sighs> That would be really interesting to look at because yeah. I can't think of a single instance where that. No, I can't was the either. Case. Which is so weird. Like you would think, after all of the experience that they had had, and I'm this is no me saying that the wine scenes are good people because they're you know they're obviously, bad bad people. Obviously, um, you know, so I'm not trying to talk them up or anything, but like they you know they got lucky with backing some really key projects you know in the early '90s, right. and I just feel like that kind of gave them power that they did not deserve. In well, more just, ways than one. You would think that at some point they would realize maybe they don't know what they're doing when it comes to recutting movies. Because if they really feel like they're always doing what's best for the movie, uh, that would that would bear out. Like that would somehow be proven. And it never was. So I don't understand why they continued that practice. But that's a different conversation and probably a completely different podcast. Yeah. And I also will say, like, if you look at something like Willard... Uh, which Glenn Morgan did a few years prior to this. Yeah. Um, I think it's a far more cohesive remake. Um, you know, I think there's some pretty strong things about it. And it's interesting to see a movie that I don't feel like he had a whole lot of uh, interference to, to contend with. Right. Versus something like this where I, you can feel the producer's fingerprints all over it. Sure. And they're, and, and they're meddling. Sure. Yeah. Which is kind of a bummer. You know what I mean? Like, I'd love to, you know, if we're talking about like Snyder cuts and whatever, like I would love to be able to see. <laughs> I'm always talking about Snyder cuts, to be fair. Yes. So, like, let's get a Morgan cut of Black Christmas 2006. You know, that would be interesting to me, like to see what he really wanted to do with this movie, because there's the pacing is just weird. You don't really settle in with any of the female characters at all. Right. Like, we're just sort of thrown in everything. And I just knowing who Glenn Morgan is as a storyteller, like, I don't feel like that's him. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. I have a, a somewhat perhaps controversial argument to make about yes. the casting. Because the movie does have a pretty stacked cast, and not I everybody mean, have, was huge at the Winst time. Well, also, you also have Winstead playing a character named Heather. So right. that's three stars right there. <laughs> um. I, I don't – Katie Cassidy is good. She does what's asked of her, you know. But I do watch this movie. I was watching this last night and this morning. Um, most of the time, kind of – personally, I find a lot of the supporting actors more compelling than I do Katie Cassidy. Um, and I know she's royalty and she, of course, is in – the four star Nightmare on Elm Street remake. So she is. <laughs> She's like the remake queen. Unassailable horror royalty. Because she was also in When a Stranger Calls. Was she too, really? Wasn't she? I think she was. Oh my gosh. Well, I, she is the I, remake hold on, queen. I'm, I, I'm, I'm curious. I, I thought it was Chloe Grace Moretz, but she might have some competition. Oh boy. I just found myself wishing that. You're when, following other characters and not Winstead her. or Michelle Trachtenberg or even Lacey Chabert was like playing the lead, was was the final girl instead of Katie Cassidy. Yeah, I will say, though, and um, this is no slight against Olivia Hussey in the original Black Christmas because she's phenomenal and I love her. But I also think Jess in that movie is the, kind of the least interesting character yeah, in that house. Yeah, she is. That's true. You know what I mean? So I almost feel like in a way it's like you this think that was on like, purpose. <laughs> They're like, Who's this? you know, I don't know. But, I, you know, I will say, like, it's, it is a shame when you look at this cast and you kind of waste all of this talent because right. you have somebody like Katie Cassidy, who's clearly gone on to do some pretty great things. You have Michelle Trachtenberg, you know, who obviously was coming off of Buffy, you know, and she's pretty, you know, she's a little bit of a spitfire. I loved Lacey Chabert because I loved Party of Five. I was never um, a Party of Five guy. 
oh man, you missing out. And Lacey I mean, Chabert even, does mostly like Hallmark movies now, right? Yeah, she was also the original Meg on Family Guy. Until she was she got before before Kunis. Yeah, she was first season Meg. Wow. Yeah. What's the story there? Why did she get I, replaced? I don't know, but I'm glad because I love Mila Kunis. Sure. So, you know, I mean, who doesn't? Like, she's just seems awesome. Although apparently she doesn't bathe her children or something. I don't what? know. That's what the Internet said. I don't know. Well, um, the Internet's never lied to me before. That's true. Um, I would even say somebody like Kristen Cloak, you know, who, of course, shows up in, fi- in the Final Destination series. You know, she's a really interesting actress. And I'll t- we'll talk about her connections to X-Files, too. Um but like, and you have somebody like also like Olive, uh, Oliver Hudson in this as well, who, you know, has gone on to do a lot of TV and things like that. Yeah. Um, you know, it just feels like they could have given this cast more to do mm-hmm. because the talent is there and they're doing everything they can do with what they've got. Right. You know, but it's just it's not enough because ultimately in this movie, like the whole story of Billy and Agnes Lenz is the focal point and is, is the most interesting part of it. So it's kind of a bummer when these girls die that you're kind of just like, Oh, okay. Like that was cool. <laughs> like you don't care where it's like, you know, we rewatched uh, the original black Christmas a few nights ago um, just for funsies. Cause it's, it's the season. Um, and like Phil dying in black Christmas 74 still makes me really sad. Like, you know, even to a degree like, um, oh, my gosh, I'm blanking now because I'm tired. Um, Lois Lane. I'm totally blanking on her name. Margot Kidder. Margot Kidder. Like, even her character. who Barb, Terry like, Hatcher? Abrasive. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, I know. Um, <laughs> There's only one Lois Lane as far as I'm concerned. Yes. Don't tell Amy Adams, right? Wasn't she Lois Lane? She was in the Snyder Cut. Let's keep bringing that up. Yes, let's do it. Let's get those oh. numbers up, Patrick. <laughs> um so like and even Barb, who's super abrasive in that movie, but she's clearly going through some stuff like that movie really lets those characters breathe. So when things bad things happen to them, it hurts. It hurts you as a viewer. We're here. You're just kind of like, cool, let's kill some people. And I, I mean, part of that is probably due to the sort of sensibilities of people watching horror in the 2000s versus the 70s. So I, sure. it's it's I like, get it. But, you know, because I think because of the success, because I think what Texas Chainsaw Massacre was 03. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we were just I think at that point, we're just raring to watch bad guys do bad things. Right. And unfortunately, in this instance, we just lose these girls along the way, which is kind of a bummer. I mean, they have some pretty cool deaths, but, you know, a lot of eyeball gouging. Love it. So many as eyeballs. A, as a as a Fulci fan, there's a lot in this movie for me, I, but I do not I like eyeball like, trauma. I feel like he would have been a fan. Oh, for sure. I feel like he would have been Agnes's biggest fan. <laughs> but this movie has it all. Eyeball gouging, incest. That's it. Just those two things. But Fulci's, Flesh cookie. Flesh oh, yeah, cookies? it does have flesh cookies. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't seem as much up Fulci's alley. But the eyeball trauma and the incest, he's all in for. Yeah, I feel like, you know, yeah, maybe not the flesh cookies, but it's, it's like I, for the for the time that it was released in, I get some of the decisions that were made. Mm -hmm. Um, But again, it's just one of those, like I dream of a, of a version of this movie that I feel like would be more like Glenn Morgan, because I just, it's, I feel like 50% of this movie is him. Okay. And 50% of this movie isn't. And it's kind of a bummer. Do you know for sure if there were like these kinds of production issues behind the scenes? Okay. Yeah. Apparently, um, the Weinsteins went off and shot a bunch of scenes, oh, basically, um, you know, of their on their own. And then they also said they also made Morgan, Glenn Morgan, like rewrite the ending and change it. And like, I get it like it, that. I'm sure Glenn Morgan wanted to do his own version. But also that impalement scene is so badass. Like yeah. that is such a great visual. And then the, the shot of her looking over the railing and you see the lights flashing behind her with the silhouette of Billy behind her, like that's freaking cool. Yeah. Like that's a really cool shot. Um, you know, so I, you know, but yeah, there was, there was a lot of headbutting. I, you know, I will say for a piece that I was working on, I did reach out to Glenn Morgan 
about doing an interview. And not that I was turned down, but I never heard back. Got it. So I'm guessing it's probably something he just wants to distance himself from. Well, his version was supposed to leave Lee alive. So it's a bummer that she dies in this version. Oh, that is a bummer. According to Wikipedia, it says Morgan's original script ended with Kelly and Lee in the hospital receiving a phone call from Billy uh, was intended to pay homage to the conclusion of the original film. But, yeah, mm. I, I get I, I'm bummed out when they kill Lee in this movie because I think she's a pretty badass character. Yeah. And also, I don't know if you know this, but she is actually married to Glenn Morgan. I did not know that. I know yeah. she has shown up in his other projects before, but I didn't know that they were married. Yeah. Which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, so, you know, and I like her in this, too. Cause she's, yeah, me too. She's sort of she's 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 probably the strongest of the, the characters we see in it. Um, but I will say, like, it was when I realized, like, you know, in retrospect, that like Andrea Martin was coming in to play Mrs. Mack. Um, again, like Mrs. Mack in the original movie is so lively and she she just feels like so fully realized. And here she's just sort of extraneous in a way. That makes me a bum, bummed out because Andrea Martin's fantastic yeah. in the original Black Christmas. So I know she would have been even more fantastic than she is. You know what I mean? Like, it's just it, it was missing a little bit of that spark when it came to the to the characters that weren't, you know, the lenses, if you will. Right. Wow, they shot stuff just for the trailer, too? Yeah, I think that was also in a time where, like, they really tried I'm down tried a rabbit to, like, hole now. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, you're going on the Black x Rebel. Should we just wrap the episode now? So you we might as well. I have some research to do. <laughs> you're like, hold on. <laughs> I mean, this is all stuff you probably should have done before. The no, episode. this movie is my new obsession. This is uh, my Zapruder film. Nice. I will make sure next year for Christmas to send you Black x Christmas presents. So. Thank you. Make sure they are full screen. <laughs> Oh, I guess I, now I just looked and saw that there's a European cut, mm -hmm, which, which is, is shorter. Four yeah. Oh, my God. How many versions of this movie are out there? So somebody could be listening to this in the UK and be like, what are you guys talking about? Like, this is the version we have. <laughs> so I don't even know what versions we're even talking about anymore. Um, but <laughs> we did mention X-Files. Yes. So I think that's part of the reason why the movie actually worked for me the first time I saw it, even though I could see it's it's very obvious flaws. Um, is that me being a huge X-Files nerd, um, you know, pretty much whenever Glenn Morgan worked on something outside of X-Files, like I was there, um, you know, so I was, I was very much, you know, I, I went to see Willard in theaters. I saw Black Xmas, um, you know, I was there and it, it's fun because like going back and watching it now and kind of realizing the connective tissue. And I, I mentioned this to you, like when we, when I texted you, I was like, you know, for this episode, you should probably watch uh, the X-Files episode at home because holy crap, there is so much overlap between that episode, which right. by, is by far for me, probably my favorite episode of the entire series. Oh, really? Oh, cause it's so dark. Yeah, it's it is. Like, it is dark. <laughs> like it's, it's one of those things. Like I remember after it aired, like people were freaking pissed um, because it was like this was before a time when you had TV ratings oh. and, you know, you're showing in the first three minutes of this episode, like people burying a deformed baby alive on like a national network. Right. After the time, Simpsons. Yeah. At a time when you don't show things like that, like these days, that'd be nothing because of like Walking Dead and stuff. Um, and so for, I remember for years because FX would used to run the. X-Files syndicated, you know, they, they handled the syndication for X-Files and home for years, never played on FX because they wouldn't even replay it. No kidding. And then eventually when it went into the rotation, they would add like a special disclaimer in front of it. And I think they only aired it after a certain time also. And they never reran the episode on network TV either. Really? Yeah. Cause people were pretty freaked out about it and it's wow. dark. I mean, it is a really grim episode, um, but it's phenomenal. Like I wish like, I wish more X-Files really, like, they, they, they do, they did a lot of horror, you know, outside of, like, the alien stuff. Like, there's a few episodes that really go pure horror. This, to me, is the peak horror of X-Files. Okay. You know, and I just loved, you know, how, you know, as soon as I saw this, I was like, oh, my God, it's like the Peacock family, but it's the lenses now. And, you know, for me, it was like one you know, realizing that um, Constance Lenz, who is the mother of Billy Lenz, 
is played by Karen Conneval, um, who is also Mrs. Peacock in Home. Oh, okay. Like, blew my freaking mind. And also, fun fact, she is she played Maurice in the new Planet of the Apes trilogy as well. Really? Wow. Yeah, she's a she I think she has a dance background, so she okay. has like a phenomenal right. like physical, you know, ability, you know, on screen. Got it. So for me, I was like, "Holy crap, like I can't even believe this." She um, has a she has a phenomenal physical ability when it comes to banging her son too. Uh yeah, that's that's definitely <laughs> a thing. Apparently not so much her lover who falls asleep. Yeah. Um but, you know, so it's like and then also you have this I, you know, the ickiness of incest, which very much prominently plays into the episode of Home uh, as well. You know, and both movies are about like a mother with, right. you know, son um, and these genetic abnormalities and things like that. So for me, like I those were the little details about Black Xmas that I really geeked out over. Um, again, totally icky. I'm not condoning like incest or anything no, like that, obviously. Um, but there's definitely things about it where I was like, oh, my God, this is like like. If ho- like this is almost like a like a, a origin story for home in a way, because like <laughs> if the movie had ended differently, like what if Billy and Agnes hooked up? Like, how does that even work? Because like he's already her brother, father, and she's, you know, his sister, daughter. <laughs> yeah, like, right. So what, what is, does what's, that what's, make what is their progeny? What does that make the kid? Shoot. Does that make the kid its own its own sibling? Like, I don't even know the math on that. <laughs> I can't do it in my head. You know, and again, when you have something like. uh uh, with home with the X Files episode, they talk about how one of the Peacock brothers, you know, is the brother to the other two, but he, he's also their father, and it's like, oh, okay, interesting. Um, so for me, like as an X File nerd, like I was in heaven, you know. Um, but again, it's like one of those like I know it has issues. I mean, you know, I, Billy Lenz kind of looks like I think I mentioned that he looks like a jaundiced Shrek. <laughs> in the movie, it was a choice. There were some choices made with that makeup. Yeah, well, according again, according to you know the Wikipedia summary, he's like almost forty. I think he still looks like a little kid. Yeah, there's that specific where I'm like, I really felt like the, I I, I forgot to do the math on it because I felt like I, I remember reading like he's supposed to be like thirty six or something, and I was that like, what are you twenty right. six? But I'm like, but I guess like. In, he was already like a certain amount of years when he was killed, but still like it's like 15 years. I, I'm too tired to do the actual math on it, but I felt like them saying he was in his 30s felt weird to me because I don't I didn't have that same math. Right. So but I did like that. He was still kind of he was kind of like in his PJs from the hospital. Right. Yeah. So he never like I mean, it's winter out. Like, how do you ru- escape from an asylum and go all the way to this house in just your PJs. I don't think he has shoes or socks on. Did he walk through all that snow? We don't see that stuff, I guess. <laughs> like, did he get like a like a pickup? Like, is there a bus? I don't know. This was pre-Uber. Yeah, uh, so it wasn't like he had Uber for an option. No. Because then he would have to have like a phone with the app on it. Yeah. And, did this you know, movie were... invent ride sharing, I guess, is the question. Mm. Or should it have? Yeah. Mm. These are these are the questions to ponder. <laughs> so, but yeah, it's one of those like you know I watch it every December. It's fun. It's it's inconsequential. Like I don't get hung up on it like the way I do Black Christmas seventy four. Like when I watch that one, like computer goes off. I'm in the moment. Everything else kind of slips away. Um, and this it's just like okay, cool. We're gonna go have some weird, gross fun, and right. then you know, kind of move on. Yeah, I, I mean, there's, well, I would have to spoil another current movie to talk about it. But there was a part of me that was like, yeah, I'm I'm fine with the with the gore and all that. There's a part of me that wishes that this one would depart from the original and keep more of the girls alive in the way that another current remake does. But then that current remake in the last 10 minutes decides to kill off a bunch of the girls that you thought were going to live too. So apparently it's just a necessary staple of these movies. Yeah. I'm also trying to figure out what you're talking about because I'm so, I don't want to say it premiered on sci-fi. Ah, okay. (laughs) Yes. And it lets you believe that like, Hey, we're going to keep these girls alive this time. And then all of a sudden with 10 minutes left, it's like, Oh no, we're not. We're going to kill them. Now it's a bloodbath. Right. Exactly. (laughs) 
Gotcha. Okay. I'm 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 on it now. I should have I should have been able to figure that out no, on my own. No, I apologize. No. I was being very obtuse. I was being acute. <laughs> <laughs> See, this I need to do more podcasts where I'm exhausted because then you get zingers like that. Oh yeah. So, you know, this is this is this is why everybody tunes in. Do they? I, I mean, not for me, no. <laughs> <laughs> They're here for you, Patrick. Oh sure. Yes. You bring the sizzle after all. <laughs> oh, for crying out loud. I know, I'm never gonna let it go. No, Ever. and you probably should. No, never. <laughs> do you have a favorite uh death in the movie? I mean, they're all pretty much. Mm. I, I do like the uh, the ice skate to the back of the head. That's sure. kind of gnarly. Yeah, it um, is. Was it? Did you have a super gnarly like uh, follow up shot to the back of the head and saw the gross goriness? I think so. Okay, because I was gonna say that's probably that's the unrated. Of you. Okay. Yeah, because it kind of lingers there on that shot for a little bit. You see a little blood ooze out and stuff like that. Yeah, I think so. Okay, then maybe you did have the unrated. There's a couple deaths where it's like blink and you'll miss it, where I was like, did they even show that? Oh, yeah, they're really fa- – like, you you can't, like, not pay attention to this right. movie. Yeah, because right, yeah, right. You're going to miss, you know, plot points. You're going to miss deaths. It does It does not rest on its laurels. Like, it literally gives you a kill in, like, in the first four minutes. Yeah. You know, and it's a really fast kill also. Um, I do appreciate that it, like, you know, uses pa- plastic bags a lot because that is probably one of my favorite, you know, and it beca- ultimately becomes the iconic imagery of, like, one version of the Black Christmas poster and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, so I like that, that it kind of just keeps sort of being this theme. And then, you know, after Billy s- gets him, hooks him, Agnes scoops out their eyes. And, you know, <laughs> so it's a, it's a nice little tag team. Um, did you ca- did you catch the other Bob Clark reference, in, like a, a reference to another Bob Clark movie in that movie? I mean, I'm assuming it's a Christmas story, but I don't know what the reference yes. is. Uh, there is a leg lamp in their living room. Oh, I don't think I saw it. Yes. Um, it's in like the back corner. You see it a lot when uh, Lacey Chabert is sitting on the couch. You see it quite a bit in those shots. Um, but I always just thought that was fun. And apparently Bob Clark was like, Totally on board with this, worked, you know, really closely with uh, Glenn Morgan because he used, I guess they met over the idea of exploring Billy Lens a lot more this time. And because I guess that was something that Bob Clark had wanted to do with the original Black Christmas. I'm glad that, like, ultimately he decided against it. Um, But he did have a whole backstory built up, you know, about who Billy was, who Agnes was, their story and things like that. So I think there was some elements from... Bob Clark's ideas that ended up, you know, coming into the script that Glenn Morgan wrote here. I did think it was weird when the characters kept talking about going to a club called Porky's. Yeah, you know, it's it seems a little idiosyncratic, doesn't it? <laughs> They're just Is wedging. That the right word? Right? Uh, That's sure. The right word. I mean, it's a word. Sure. Let's make it work. They That's just, us. Idiosyncratic. They should have this whole movie should just be Bob Clark fan fiction and they just keep working in as many <laughs> references as possible that would have been great i that might that might have bumped it up another half star for maybe me. maybe you know is porky's bob clark's worst movie it's probably not right because he made baby geniuses oh you know i'll be honest i might watch baby geniuses more than i would watch <laughs> porky's and the only reason i say that is because i'm pretty sure parts of baby geniuses was shot in villa park illinois at the ovaltine factory really I think so. Um, I'm going to go down my own rabbit hole right now. All right. Um, but I'm pretty sure they shot some scenes there, which was like right down the street. And the Ovaltine factory in Villa Park was like this like sort of place where like you try to dare people to go into, but nobody ever got into it because like the fence was too freaking high. <laughs> um, so now I'm going to go down to Baby Geniuses hole. And this is all your fault. I saw Baby Geniuses in a theater. No, you didn't. I did because I had to like babysit my best friend's girlfriend because it was like a thing where like they couldn't hang out. But uh, so I would have to hang out in his place. And uh, in 99, in 99. Yeah. How and that old was... were these people you were hanging out with? Yeah, no, they were my age. I mean, they were like 21, 22. What? Um, and she wanted to see Baby Geniuses. And I was like, OK, so that's what we did. 
That's that is really crazy. I saw it on the big screen, projected on thirty-five millimeter. Now you'd have people like freaking out if they could see baby geniuses in thirty-five millimeter. Yeah, you would. There'd be somebody who'd be like super into that. There'd you be know a what? line at the New Beverly. I don't think it's baby geniuses. I think it's baby's day out. That sounds more accurate because that's John Hughes. Yes, I'm pretty sure now that I'm looking at the imagery. Wow. I just had I just had a whole journey here with all of this, <laughs> which I also did not see in theaters. Uh, I I have never seen Baby's Day Out. No, I haven't either, and I'm okay with it. Yeah, right. It, nothing about it really appealed to me. Not like Baby Geniuses, where I was clearly on board from minute one. Oh, of course. It's, it's they're babies classic. and they're geniuses. One, please. Sold. <laughs> Sold. But I so, never saw yeah, Super Babies, sense. Baby Geniuses two. Which I think Bob Clark also made, and maybe that's his worst movie. Uh, (laughs) I I couldn't say for sure. He keeps he keeps raising slash lowering the bar for us here, doesn't he? Yikes! (laughs) Oh boy! Wow! You know, this is this is this has been a journey, Patrick. We have talked about some (sighs) real classic movies. He did do uh, Super Babies, Baby Geniuses too. Did he really? He did. That was his last movie in 2004. Oh, no. I know he picked because he passed away sh- like less than a year after this came out, right? Um, he died in 2007. He... Yeah, in April of 2007. Oh, that is a bummer. I also uh, read when I was doing some research uh, that Shirley Walker, who was the composer, uh, this was also her final movie because she passed away a year or not a year, a month before this came out what the hell this movie's cursed it is i don't like it i that's i feel like it's that video from the ring and now i shouldn't have watched it especially in full screen merry christmas to us here we go damn it Mm. Mm. anyway i meant to meant to tell you when we were talking about x files um when i mentioned Kristen cloak yeah um so she actually was in an episode of the x files as well that glenn morgan had done um and it's actually i think it's the episode after home um, which is called the field where I died, where it's like this woman who, um, they think she has, um, I just pulled it up cause I was, couldn't remember the name of it. Dis- uh, just dissociative identity disorder. Okay. Um, but it's really like, she's almost, she has like these reincarnated memories. Um, and so she had like this thing where like, she felt like she had connected to Mulder in a past life or something like that, but she's really great in that episode. Cool. So, yeah, I think that was uh, it was like two episodes later. OK. Yeah. Or three. Sorry. I don't want to I don't want to mes- make anybody from X-Files fandom upset. It was three episodes later. Yeah, please. If there's one thing you get right, it had better be details about the X-Files. Look, there's you don't want to make the Star Wars fans mad. You don't want to make any no. comic book movie fans mad on either side of the fence of that that whole thing. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to make the X files with a pH upset. <laughs> I'll make the X files fans mad. Ready? I don't mind that second X files movie. Um, I don't either, but I will say the first time I saw it, I did hate it because my ex like showed up when I went to go see it. Oh, and I didn't want him to. I just wanted to go see it after work. And yeah, he just right. showed up at the theater. And I was like, what, what are you doing? I just want to go see my X-Files movie. So I sat there with like my arms crossed the whole time. I was just really angry. Um, so the first time I saw it. Were you exes it. Um, at the time? Oh, uh, we were separated. Yeah. Were you? OK. Well, that's yeah. uncomfortable. Yeah, it was it was super awesome. Because that's, cool. that's, that's, that's what I want to be. <laughs> but that's the memory that I want to associate with anything related to the <laughs> X Files. Um, so it is the the EX Files, if you will. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I actually went back and rewatched it a few years ago, and I didn't dislike it. I think it was better than it got credit for. I think it's just it's hard because the first X Files movie was so about that Mulder Scully dynamic and relationship that everybody loved, and this was different. It was them at a different point in their lives. Um, and, you know, Billy Connolly is playing sort of this really unsavory character that you're supposed to care about. But there's aspects to him that he just makes it impossible yeah. to care about. So and I'm glad I gave it another viewing because I liked it more the second time for sure. I haven't seen it since the theater, but I remember not hating it. Did my ex show up and go with you, too? I assume so. There was just some random guy that was sitting next to me the whole time. Yeah. Being like, are you sure you don't want popcorn? Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. And you're like, no, I'm good, dude. <laughs> so, yeah. 
I don't think he's listening to this anyway, so I don't feel bad making jokes. It's fine. We're all good. All so, right, good. But, I just, but it was just one of those things where I was just like, really? We're doing this? Okay. <laughs> so I was like, I just worked like an eight hour shift at Super Target. I just want to go watch my X-Files movie in peace. Understandable. You know, I'm a girl of simple pleasures. Yeah. That's all. Yeah. So. Uh, what else we got to say about this movie? Uh I don't really know, to be yeah, honest. I don't either. I don't either. <laughs> I feel like we've covered the gamut here, but I will All say, right. you know, in the terms, you know, again, the 2000s were this huge boom of remakes. And I don't, you know, it's it's nowhere near like the the badness of something like Nightmare on Elm Street. It, it doesn't quite hit the same highs of me like as Texas Chainsaw or Sorority Row or things like that. It's just kind of there in the middle. But it's still a movie I enjoy getting to watch every holiday season. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's still like a fun, weird holiday favorite. Like, if you're in the mood for something gross and goopy and, mm-hmm. you know, I guess, you know, family fun. Yeah. No, I would agree movie. with that. I, I think it's messy, but it's energetic. It moves along pretty well. Um, I mean, it, it wastes no time going. Right, right. So, you know, I mean, it's like, like I said, there's, I've seen worse, you know, Christmas horror movies. Let's just sure. put it that way. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> Far worse. <laughs> I'll bet with some of the stuff you've watched for columns you've written or, you know, um, I, I, maybe I'm just not a big Christmas horror guy. I don't, I can't, I don't feel like I've seen that many Christmas horror movies. I've seen like many of the classics and then a few of the also rans but i haven't really? i haven't gone super deep okay because like i'm I'm just pulling up my list. so have you gone through the silent night deadly night franchise i've seen the first two and that's it and they're all up on shutter now so i've been meaning to watch the next three but i haven't yet okay um because that, that's something i actually want to do next week is kind of go through because i've never i've never gone past two either but yeah. uh, there's a lot of folks on twitter who seem to be really in the camp of like the uh, three, four and five are actually pretty fun. One of them is Monty Hellman. I know maybe five, five is five used now. Oh, five is Mickey Rooney, yeah. right? The toy maker. I thought that was Monty Hellman, but I could be it absolutely be. wrong. Maybe Monty Hellman I, is three. You no, know, you, you could be totally right. Believe me. I know one of them, Brian Husna directed. Though. Okay. So I'm trying to think of what's, what's, what would Brian Usna do? Um, right. You know, uh, so are you, are you not a big fan of like, uh, oh, what are they, uh, the, uh, holy crap, I'm totally blanking on the name, like Christmas Evil? Um, no, I love Christmas Evil. Okay, well, see, there you go. Yeah. Yusna did four. Okay, that's what it is. So Monty Hellman must have done three. Yeah, he did. That's and the I'm one with, sure uh, with uh, Bill Mosley, right? right? Yeah. 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 Uh, and I'm sure you're a huge Santa Slay fan, because who isn't? I've only seen like that opening scene with all the famous people getting killed, but it no. is showing. Yeah, for real. It's on Peacock. Is it? OK, I will totally and watch Sling it. TV. It's showing tonight at the music box in 35 millimeter, the only existing print. I'm not a je- I'm not jealous at all, by the way, that that's happening. <laughs> so it's fine. It's fine that you people in Chicago are doing that. And yeah. I'm here. That's yeah. fine. That's all great. Um, may you choke on it. Um, I'm not I, going. I'm, well, guilt by association. <laughs> um, I also like really enjoyed Dial Code Santa Claus last year because I think Joe Bob showed that on his. Yeah, that was fun. Episode. That's a fun yeah, one. I'd, I'd never seen it before. Um, I'm looking here also. Are you into. I'm, I'm going to watch actually for the first time because it's on Shutter as well. <coughs> Pardon me. Uh, is To All a Good Night. I'm not expecting it to be a great movie. I enjoy To All a Good Night. It's the. Okay, I'm cu- I've been always been curious about it. And I've never had a chance to see it. The sole directorial effort of terrifying human David Hess. Which apparently he's like the nicest person ever. But right. I, at the three times I saw him at a convention, I was like, I'm not going anywhere near him. No, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm also I'm looking at my list here. So okay. I, and in the apocalypse, how does that rank for you? Love it. Okay, good, because I would really hate to end our friendship now. <laughs> um, also, there's Rare Exports. Uh, I've seen it. I don't remember it that well. Oh, well, maybe maybe this is the year to revisit. Yeah, perhaps. Yes. 
I've also decided because Brian Collins has been championing it for years now. I feel like this is my year to give P2 a chance again. Oh, P2 I've never seen. I thought you were going to say Red Christmas, which he also champions. Oh, yeah. No, that movie can go straight to hell. (laughs) I've seen that one. (laughs) Sorry, anybody who's involved with that movie, but I'm not a fan. Uh, Yeah. Not uh, not a fan. I've seen Red Christmas. I've never seen P2. And you know what else I just found that is is streaming on Amazon Prime that I want to watch because I saw a lot of people talking about it last year. And I was like, all right, well, I've got to give this a chance. Uh, Is Santa Jaws. Never seen Santa Jaws. I haven't either. So... Um, and if you're looking for feel good horror, there's always the lodge. Uh, sure. Place. Yeah. I've seen that one. <laughs> if, you, if you feel like opening a vein or two during the holidays. Well, sometimes I it recommend... hurts to laugh that much. Oh, it does. It really does. You know, laughter, you know, it's the best and worst medicine. <laughs> um, and I will say a friend of mine actually did a, a pretty fun, like low budget. Uh, actually, I have a few friends who've done pretty fun, low budget. Christmas horror movies because you have Rebecca McKendry who did all, all the, the creatures, creatures for stirring. stirring. Yeah, I've seen that one. And then Spooky Dan Walker who did Sleigh Bells. I've seen Sleigh Bells. And then there's also my friend Sean Kane uh, did Silent Night Zombie Night, which is a movie that we actually met over on MySpace. Okay. And he was I actually interviewed him for it uh, when they were in production on it, which nice. has Felissa, Felissa Rose in it. I have not seen that one. It's fun. I mean, it's like he made the movie for next to nothing, but yeah. there's a fun, you know, zombie Santa in it. I be- I'm pretty sure, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, Lou Temple is in it, as is Vernon Wells. Okay, wow. Um, and that's streaming on Tubi as well, because Tubi has everything. So. Yes, it and then does. Also, I, I mean, I feel like this would probably be a movie you'd be a fan of, uh, which is I Trapped the Devil. Uh, I like I Trapped the Devil. Yeah. It's like so, a Twilight you know, Zone episode. I guess I've seen more Christmas horror than I thought. I feel like you might actually be a Christmas horror fan, Patrick. I must be, because I've seen all these goddamn movies. I like Krampus. Yeah. Oh, my God, Krampus, yes. Yeah. You know what? When Gremlins. I, Gremlins, obviously. Dante? Yeah, Joe Dante, come on. Um, there's one that I don't totally love that has been getting a ton of love online lately. And I'm trying to remember hmm. the name of it. A Christmas Horror Story? Is that what it's called? You know what? There's parts of that movie that I think are really good. It's an anthology, right? I'm thinking of the yeah. right movie. Yeah. Yeah, you are. Uh, yeah, there's parts. I just don't feel like any of the stories pay off, at least from my memory. It's been a few years, so maybe I, I'm due for a revisit. Yeah, I'd say, you know, if you've got if you've got a spare, you know, 90 minutes, go for it. Can't hurt. I mean, it could hurt. Who am I to it say? It could hurt. I don't know. <laughs> All that laughter could just really hurt. Well, nothing's going to be as funny as The Lodge. No, I mean, I, look, no mo- movies don't scare me anymore. Like, I'm I'm past that point. Yeah. But that movie actually gave me panic attacks. Really? It did, um, because I remember I saw it at Sundance. And I literally woke up in my hotel room that night because, like, it was the first night of Sundance. I get a little disoriented when I'm traveling because sometimes I'll wake up in the middle of the night and forget that I'm traveling. And I'm like, wait, this isn't my bedroom. Um, plus altitude kind of messes with your head a little bit like right. that first day that you're there. Right. And I literally woke up at one point in the night and I thought somebody had duct taped my mouth shut. Oh, my gosh. And I woke up and I felt like I couldn't breathe. Yikes. And then there was another time in the night where I actually felt like somebody was pulling me. It was. Yeah. I've never had that happen with a movie that I've covered ever. Awesome. Yeah. So that was that was a super fun experience. I was like, I. I really like I I really think that movie was done extremely well. I think it's really dark and disturbing. I probably will never watch it again because my God, did it just rip my guts out? Yeah, I'm in the same boat. So, you know, I respect those filmmakers immensely. I think they're fantastically talented. But thank you for making a movie that completely unnerved me uh, (laughs) because that doesn't that just doesn't happen you know, anymore. Like it just really doesn't. I'm dead inside is what I'm trying to say. Good. And this is a call for help. <laughs> Good. <laughs> I'm glad that we got to this point in the podcast and I feel like that's uh, our cue to wrap it up. Yeah. Well, you know, you're my horror BFF. So I figure these are things we could talk about. Good. Good. Let's talk <laughs> about it on the air. Yes. Happy holidays. everybody. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you for listening <laughs> uh, all year long. Thank you for supporting Daily Dead. Thank you for supporting Corpse Club. Thank you for getting through this year with us. Uh, Thank you, Heather, for being my horror BFF. 
Thank you for being my horror BFF, Patrick. Uh, until next time, everyone, stay scary. And Mary. Thank mm-hmm. you.